It's March 25th, 2021. This is Rook. He is the Iranian-American kid who has become best known as the Urban Monk, a title that's also the name of his New York Times bestseller. Pedram Shojai's latest book is called Focus, and in it he discusses a methodology around attending to our priorities and health when our lives are increasingly occupied by social media and screen time. He is the founder of Well.org and the Urban Monk Academy, the editor of Be More magazine, and a film producer, director, and podcaster. Pedram Shojai joins me for a feature interview today from Utah, plus we have another edition of It's All Persian to Us. This is Conversations from To and About the Iranian Diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Welcome to episode number 96 of Rook. Navadoshish, Kion. That's in Farsi. Trying to help you. Hope, or, hope you are keeping well, whatever you're, do, uh, whatever you're doing, <laughs> wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Vamizun Hastin. We are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. Uh, we come to you on SoundCloud, on Spotify, iTunes, Instagram, YouTube, CastBox, and Telegram. We are um, accumulating our followers from around the world. And you know what I say to that? What do you say? Chamas <laughs> Karanat. That's the Chamas I was wondering when we're going to go back to Chamas You know, it made it into the Noruz video. Uh, I think uh, for me, it's the highlight, in fact, of the <laughs> Noruz video, <laughs> given that there's some... Uh, Obscure dancing and uh, salty language. I think Chames Karanat might just be the uh, the ultimate highlight. If you want to check out our Noru's video, that said, uh, you can go to our website, rookmedia.com. You can also check us out on Clubhouse, by the way. Join us there. You can find me there. You know what? Uh, we do uh, Friday nights on uh, Clubhouse so far. I might move the night because I'm thinking yeah. after COVID. Summertime, people want to go Who's going to want to come and talk to us on Clubhouse Not on Friday me. night? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we don't even want to talk to each other. <laughs> but for now, Friday nights, mm. 8 p.m. Eastern on Clubhouse. Keon, uh, you know what we're going to talk about tomorrow night? What's that? I, I don't know. I was oh, hoping okay. you would know. I, yeah. I would <laughs> rely on you for this. <laughs> some, some old... Uh, Old school humor. <laughs> or Masabzi? I don't know. <laughs> no, I got some good. I got some good. I got some mm. ideas. Tomorrow night on Clubhouse, 8 p.m. Our Rook Town Hall. Pedram Shujai joining me in just a few moments. Um, so he was at UCLA, ready to become a doctor like a good Persian kid. Uh, then pivoted and pursued Eastern medicine and healing. He is now an acclaimed Jigong master. Uh, his journey has been an interesting one, as well as the... Uh, little wellness empire he's built. We'll get to all of that. Pedram Shojai, I'm looking forward to this conversation coming up in just a few moments. You can uh, show your support for Rook, keep us going in a couple of different ways. One way is to become a patron and uh, for five or 10 bucks a month, if you go to our website, rookmedia.com, if you're a regular, especially regular listener or viewer of, of Rook, we'd love you to become a patron rookmedia.com and you press support us and it leads you to a page where you sign up uh, we don't do anything with your information other than look at the list of people who signed up and go oh we like Sweet, these people nice. they're so nice uh, there we appreciate that <laughs> some folks show support in other ways and I want to give a shout out to uh, someone named Yoss Sadra and her company Le Jasmine Bakery which is a bakery in Toronto 
Uh, Yoss dropped off these uh, lovely treats for us That's so sweet. and said, I love so your delicious. show. When we're baking at La Jasmine, we listen to, to Rook. We have it on and we listen and, we, and it inspires us while we're baking. And I mean, that was, it, that was fantastic. So, so it was delicious. Delicious. They know what they're doing. This God, uh, sure La did. Jasmine Bakery. The other thing, though, was that the, I, I wasn't here. Captain Reza got this, this Yoss. She wrote a little note. And uh, the handwriting was beautiful. Oh, I've seen it. It's yeah, really it's nice handwriting. And it reminded me how much handwriting means to me. Like I I, I, I feel it's it feels so antiquated to yeah. care about handwriting, but it still does. Right. Like I, I fa- <laughs> I've told this story before a couple of times in my life, but uh, I, 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 there was somebody I was dating years ago that I was really into. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't, I mean, this day and age, you don't really see handwriting no. you could you could be dating someone for two months and not see their handwriting because sure. you're writing text messages or you know whatever yeah. and so then she gave me a card at one point and she had that sort of grade school bubble writing you know <laughs> you know where you put the like like yeah. you put the uh, the dot of the eye and put a little That's heart like and like writing. it was no it's not like your writing it was I, it was terrible it was a deal breaker i was like I can't, are you serious i can't no. yeah wow. i can't how could you no really it's too much handwriting I, i'm into hand, i'm into handwriting i've been to and so then today it's uh we got to mention it's uh producer susan's birthday mm-hmm. happy birthday to birthday. our dear susan and uh whose writing are you judging well <laughs> so i i i had this idea let's get i went and got a card everybody signed the card everybody's Boy. chipping in for it so <laughs> Oh no! no so then you guys, you guys, you guys have all written <laughs> I in the can't card. Wait to oh, hear this. I mean, it's I'm definitely okay. not dating any of you, but <laughs> but uh, if I were to date, I mean, Savvy Rohan. No way. This guy he has good writing. Wow. He has a way with a pen. I tell you, it looks beautiful. It's I mean, he wrote in Farsi, so I'm oh, trying to make so out what he said. Oh, but was the one with the Farsi writing? Isn't that beautiful? I saw the card. Yeah, Savvy Rohan with the Sibyl, <laughs> and the guy has handwriting like That's that. And amazing. Shia wasn't so bad. Keon, your writing is nice. Listen, Gian, I was sweating. I had to <laughs> sign the card while you were watching, and no, I, your I could feel is, you judging me. Your handwriting is lovely. Now, I was Captain really Reza. Hard. Oh boy. Oh no. Captain, Re- I mean, he. <laughs> I, I would recommend next time just leaving a paw mark, like just you know, <laughs> yeah. putting your hand in some it's ink garbage. and. And then just putting it, I mean, it is a, yeah, a disaster. Weird. I can't even, I don't even know what he's saying. He's, I, I think it's in English, <laughs> but it's just this like, no, it's bad. you know, it's for garbage. such a handsome guy, you only assume that is. That's why. That, no, 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 no. This is the thing. That's why he's handsome. So he's <laughs> been able he to is. cruise along <laughs> in life with without that. learning how to write. You know? <laughs> without learning how to write. Oh yeah. Well, Illiterate. Hey, English is his second language. So, you know, maybe uh, that's, his that's not the reason. Reason. Trust me. I mean, Ponta, you know, her English is a great, beautiful handwriting. She's an artist, my dear. Yeah. Ponta, the, to Ponta the artist. How's Shia's? Uh, Shia's was lovely. Oh. Yeah, no, I think, right? Shia, I mean, you're not going to say it yourself. In, in Farsi or in English? Uh, well, you wrote in Farsi. I wrote to in me, Farsi. it looked very beautiful, but I don't. I can't yeah, judge. Yeah, my the, handwriting is good actually oh, in Farsi. Well, you but you know what's <laughs> funny? Uh, I think like my handwriting in Farsi is terrible too. And growing up, I, it was no, 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 no ca- Captain Reza, That was never a question. <laughs> no, but. <laughs> Clearly, clearly, whatever language it is in, you're 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 writing. Like, write here's nice the thing: he's a, a, a great thinker, great filmmaker. You know, I mean, great. He's you know, he knows his way around an editing suite. You know, but this guy, keep him away from writing anything. Because <laughs> don't if you are. I mean, I, I, well, you're I lucky. Know. You're yeah. good looking. But do you really think? I mean, good looking doesn't cut it. If you with the, you know, <laughs> oh the, the writing. Oh, you don't care. W- w- about what? About if your writing? Paramore had terrible I handwriting. I would wouldn't you? judge them based on their writing. No, you wouldn't. No. So on a first date, if you do, you get your dates to write down <laughs> their sh- names. <laughs> <or> <laughs> what you, I, I really know? should. <laughs> I, I saw this thing from Yas, and I was like, "Oh work. my god, <laughs> I don't." This is like she. Look at her writing. I mean, I, I, I think it, it was spectacular. It was beautiful. All right. So I'm but, never going to write in front of you no, again. No, no, no. It, it. No, no. I mean, look. Maybe I don't know if it's a deal breaker, but it's certainly. There's something disappointing if it looks like. I mean, if I was dating someone and the, their handwriting was like Captain Ressa, <laughs> they I would could just, be. They gotta be a really like everything <laughs> else checks off and you know everything perfect. else. I would I would say I'm sorry. Really, this is, You're this is not working wow. out. 
yeah. but have you heard of that Persian myth that uh, uh, people with bad handwritings are usually like smart like doctors have terrible handwritings in Iran that's apparently. true that's not a Persian myth that's true oh, that's, that that's here too doctors uh, the chicken scratch and stuff yeah I mean I'm I'm uh, oh, there you go. Uh, I, I, I get that although I just I just think that it's something, and, and it's totally unfair because uh, the newer the generation is, like there's less reason to write with your, you know, cursive or whatever. I mean, you're, you're typing yeah. everything. So, so what do you associate that with, good handwriting? Like, what does that mean? For to you? some reason, and I know it's totally not cool. I know it's totally not scientific, but for some reason, I feel like if someone has nice handwriting or good has good handwriting they are probably more well read and they probably uh are more artistic they're probably you know they probably huh. uh are they probably more more careful or more caring Neat. yeah put together okay. yeah i don't know no, no, no. i mean no, it no. makes sense to me that shia <laughs> has good handwriting yeah. you know he's a guy who reads a lot uh, and he, yeah and also he's, I, he, I i was trained you know i in, oh, in this school yeah right, and, right. And so do you care about uh, handwriting shia when somebody if um, you're dating somebody or you're somebody's uh, uh, uh yes actually yeah. Yeah. see uh, it's not just me but you see people with good handwriting yeah care. that's right yeah. Sha- Sha- i have bad writing so i, I have like no I've room to it. judge anybody <laughs> my yeah. handwriting thank you reza you yeah. like my no, hand it's good no i really like but you you know you know i'm ocd i mean on the whiteboard it when somebody changes something and writes it, you know, producer Susan writes something, I have to rewrite it because I can't look <laughs> at that. Not only rewrite it, like on the whiteboard, like when we try to put like names of people or whatever, he's like, oh, he's missing a comma. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, who cares? <laughs> Your grammar's he's impeccable. He's meticulous, <laughs> so I get it. I feel handwriting, some people write it mature, even it's bad, but it you can get a feel that it's mature handwriting, mm. but some of them is like, you know, uh, f- first grade <laughs> people, and yeah, I, I don't like that kind right, of... Right, right, right. Yeah, if it looks... Yeah, that That's exactly what I'm... I think that's partly what I'm talking about. Mm. If it looks like... Uh, but And this is totally unscientific, and I'm totally... Uh, I, I, I'm sure there's brilliant, brilliant people out there that I would love who have, you know, terrible handwriting. I'm just... Yeah, and, by, and by the way, my I feel like I'm, I mean, I'm sure we all feel this way, but I feel like I'm degenerating. My handwriting is getting worse because we don't, we don't write as much. You know, I used to write letters mm-hmm. when I was in my t- little teens and 20s. I would write love letters. I would care wow. about every kind of, and now I, I'm i writing something and I go, what happened yeah. to my handwriting? It's, it's a dying you know, art. It's, you don't, you have no cause for yeah. it. That's one thing. Even like 10 years ago or 11 years ago, whatever, like I would I would be writing like an outline for like a short film or whatever. Like, mm. and I'd be writing it mm. down and then turning it into a script. Do Nowadays, I don't even do that. I write, I type it in my phone and then yeah. take it home. If there was a way for you to type on this birthday card, I swear, <laughs> you know, I, I was going through that. Like I got, you know, because the car got passed around, it comes back to me. I see, oh, there's Roham, there's, and then, and Roham's writing in Persian and Shia, and then Ponta, actually Ponta wrote, wrote in English, and it was very, and there's Kia, and then I'm like, I think that's, <laughs> what language is, is Reza writing in English or Farsi? Like I, I Maybe I, Ugi wrote that. <laughs> Oh man, uh. I feel like he's got a better handwriting than I. Uh. Uh. All right, uh, now you, we've got a new edition of "It's All Persian Notes" yes, coming up, right? We do. It's shocking. Any hints? It's shocking. It's very shocking. Oh. All right. It might start a war amongst Ooh. nations. Okay. Well, like we'll like look that. forward to that. Um, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. Thank you. Uh, you are all fantastic. We'll get to "It's All Persian" to us in a little while. Let's get to our feature guest. My future guest today moved to the United States with his Iranian parents at the age of three in 1978 and was on track to become a traditional doctor when he attended UCLA, like any self-respecting and dutiful Persian boy. But life and inspiration intervened, and Pedram Shojai found a path towards ancient Eastern healing that became his passion and his practice. Now, he is well known as the man who has brought Eastern practices of living a fulfilling and healthy life into busy Western lives. Or, to put it another way, he has become the urban monk. Pedram Shojai is the founder of Well.org and the Urban Monk Academy, the editor of Be More magazine, and a film producer, a director, a podcaster. He is also the author of several books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Urban Monk, Rise and Shine, and The Art of Stopping Time. 
Pedram is a doctor of oriental medicine, an acclaimed Qigong master who has studied Kung Fu and Tai Chi for decades, a Taoist abbot with a practical approach to modern living, as well as a global green advocate and a devout alchemist. His latest book is called Focus, Bringing Time, Energy, and Money into Flow. And right now, Pedram Shojai joins me from Deer Valley, Utah today. Hello, sir. Hi, great to be here. Very nice to have you on the program. You know, the first thing that occurs to me is, is a global pandemic a boon to an urban monk who likely has a lot more folks needing to deal with trauma and changing conditions around them? Or has it been just as annoying for you as the rest of us? I, you know, I'm a bit of a recluse, so um, I, you know, it's, it kind of it kind of favored um, my tendencies. Anyways, is I was traveling, doing a lot of stuff, um, developing some social indigestion, if you will, um, and got to the point where you know we got a year and a half um, made the move up here. So I have a hundred thousand acres of woods right behind my house, wow. and so we didn't really feel cagey. Uh, we missed people, right? Um, but we didn't feel cagey and boxed in. Uh, thanks to Mother Nature. But if I can say this without it sounding crass, uh, take away all the crassness of it, has it been good for business in the sense that people have been dealing with a lot and look to outlets like yours to to find ways to cope? Uh, yes and no. Um, you know, we had emphasized a couple of years ago, uh, really moving into uh, more retreats and in-person events because I enjoy that the most. And um, uh, we took a beating there, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but the rest of the parts of the business, the film, the streaming service, everything else um, has done quite well. So, you know, depending on which part of the business you ask. So, um, you know, some parts got hurt. Some parts did uh, better than normal. Petra, I want to get into your personal story, uh, especially because you're an Iranian boy, but we haven't heard a lot about that side of you um, in in the media, even though I'm well aware of your presence. But let me let me start with this new book. Uh, I quite enjoyed reading it. It's uh, it's quite absorbing. It's it's called Focus, and at the heart of the book, you have a chapter entitled Your Life Garden. And I quite like this. You, you use the metaphor. Uh, of a garden for our life journey and its facets as something that needs to be watered and nurtured. Can you just expand on that metaphor? Sure. I mean, if your life were a garden, what are the more more or most important plants to water? You got your family, you got your friends, your your health, obviously, your career, your desires, your passions, just all the stuff. And if each of them were a plant, how much water in the form of time, money, and energy is it going to take? And um, how much are you allocating? And what are you saying is important versus where your water is going? Um, and, you know, it's really easy to talk about work-life balance. It's really easy to talk, quite frankly. But, you know, where the rubber hits the road is where you put your, where you put your water in life, your time, money, and energy. And if it's not focused on the things that you say are your priorities, then either you're unconsciously watering weeds or you're kidding yourself. Um, both of which we are very good at doing. And so, you know, it's just really, look, you could have the life that you choose, but you might have to say no to some other things and stop watering some things that are taking off too much water and, um, you know, your self-proclaimed priorities, um, whether you are actually putting your money where your mouth is, um, that's something only you can do. Well, exactly. That That's the part I wanted to actually pick up on because even saying my life is like a garden, it needs watering, can sound like a platitude, can sound kind of twee. Um, but part and parcel of that occurs to me of the garden metaphor is that notion that we have to make tough decisions around what what priorities we have that need watering and what which ones we're going to move the watering away from. Those decisions can be actually hard to make in the day-to-day. Can you speak to that? Well, I mean, just look at my career. I'm a filmmaker. I was traveling 90 days a year, um, and then these kids started acting up. You know, I don't know my dad, right? And and so, you know, I'd be gone a little too often. I'd come back. We'd have aberrant behavior. You know, obviously, I'd miss my family. My wife missed me and all that. And the kids um, were starting to behave differently because dad was, you know, in and out a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I had to sit there and look at my own life garden and say, dude, what are your priorities to raise a a vibrant family and be the dad that you choose to be or to, you know, have to be at every one of these shoots and meet the experts and and rub elbows with, you know, X, Y and Z. And um, I've been home. (laughs) You know what I mean? I'd rather be with my family. 
that's beautiful. That also feels big picture. Tell me, tell me on a daily basis how often you cross check based on the life garden uh, metaphor. Like in other words, if 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 the priorities in the garden, if the plants in the garden that you um, are committed to watering or time with my family, um, maintaining my health by working out, uh, you know, making sure I eat dinner at 6 p.m. or something. And I say, hey, Pedro, it's uh, we just finished work at 6 p.m. Let's go for a beer. Do you cross check that and go, well, that's not in my garden? I mean, how, how specific do you get with this? hundred percent. And and look, maybe you and I, you know, are 20 years overdue on a beer. And maybe the answer is, look, um, honey, I got an old college friend in town and I really need to see him. It's time to go get a beer. And I know I'm going to lose my, my workout, my sleep quality and my family time. And I'll have to make it up to you somewhere. And sometimes that pencils, right? Um, you know, I'm not necessarily saying, say no to everything. It's just be better at saying no um, at the right moment. But the problem is, if I'm not living in the part of my brain, the prefrontal cortex, that gives me a fighting chance to even weigh that option against all my previous yeses, Mm -hmm. I'm going to say hell yes before I even think about it. And then my impulsive decision leads to uh, inertia and friction and and imbalance downstream mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. I have to make up for with Advils and coffees and whatever the hell else comes after a night of beers, <laughs> right, right. Um, let alone being the guy who doesn't show up for his family. And then I got a price to pay. Right. And so I have to, you know, everyone thinks of meditation as the time on the cushion. Look, you know, I've studied with the Dalai Lama. I've been around the block. Meditation is the operating system that's constantly scanning that allows me to be aware and conscious in that moment to be like, man, it'd be great to get a beer with you, but I got stuff tonight. What are you doing Saturday or whatever, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to use that decision-making matrix as a way to better assemble my life around my priorities, not yours, because you just happen to be ready for a beer right now, doesn't mean I should say yes to that. How not to go too far into the rabbit hole on this, but I'm so interested uh, and, and I feel like I, w- I wanna know if, on a very personal level how to do this. H- how much of a prescribed life do we then lead? Because, I mean, we just had this guest on, uh, Iranian American uh, multidisciplinary artist, this beautiful vocalist, Susan Dehim. You know, she's worked with Peter Gabriel and all these folks. She's, she's fantastic. One of the things she's known for as a vocalist is her improvisational style. I asked her about that, and she said, my goal is to live an improvisational life. We hear a lot about this, like live in the moment, embrace it, you know, anything can happen five minutes from now, so just, and it occurs to me that that butts up against the idea of what we're talking about, which is very prescribed, and sometimes I feel like to really follow the kind of life I want to lead, which is what you're, what we're talking about, it's these are my priorities, I want to get up early, I want to, I want to work out, I want to make sure I do this, I want to make sure I don't eat too late, I want to make sure I spend time, see my mom, whatever, um, that then I'm that guy, I'm, I've turned into an old guy all of a sudden who has to go to bed early and, you know, who has no spontaneity, how do you navigate that? Well, there are specific strategies to build resilience. Um, I like Marty Seligman's work on positive psychology. The more time, energy, and love I could put into those kids when I walk out of this door at five o'clock or whatever it is to feed that meter, the more cushion I have to say, you know what, man, let's go for a beer, right? And so I think you have to Take care of, it's like a a Pareto's principle. You got to take care of the 80-20. So take care of yourself enough during 80% of the time to leave room for magic to happen, leave room for spontaneity, um, and just, you know, be able to relax. I don't like to overcommit. I don't like to overbook. Um, But, you know, look, at at the end of the day, my five-year-old happens to be hungry around lunchtime every day. So Mm -hmm. there ain't that much spontaneity there. Right. right. And so right, I love right. how artists can like talk about all this, but you know, they're not really dealing with the reality of a kid throwing a tantrum because you forgot to feed right. him two hours. Right. Ago. Right. If I don't take my dog out first thing in the morning, he'll have to pee in the house. There's no, That's it. yeah. Yeah. That's it. And downstream cleaning up poop off your carpet is a hell of a lot more work right. than handling it when it was the time to do it. Isn't it? So much of your teaching and your focus through your books uh, and forgive me if I sound like a, a six-year-old asking these questions, but it's the only way I know how because this is not an area I'm I'm deep in other than doing Bikram yoga for a few years and stuff like that. 
so much of your focus in your books has been about energy. You talk about energy being the currency of life. If you can do this in a an accessible way, what is the most important thing we need to know about energy? Well, let's let's kick it back a notch and look at what energy is, right? Um, you know, billions of years ago, we had this rock spinning around this planet, and the fungal kingdom showed up by hook or by crook, was able to break those rocks into soil. That soil and then became the substrate for the plant kingdom, which magically found a way to grab photons from that star and turn them into energy in the form of carb carbohydrates. And then we came along eating those plants or eating the animals that ate those plants. And so we are extracting sunlight from calories right here on planet Earth and using it to power the muscles, the brains, the nerves, the everything to live these things called our lives. And we have a finite amount of time. It comes, it goes, we're gone. And if you look at the currency of life, everything, every thought that you have, that little thing that you did with your neck right there, that's all predicated on energy and available energy. And the problem is most of us live on the breadline of energy. Most of us are borrowing energy from tomorrow to get through today, having a third cup of mm -hmm. coffee because I can't keep my damn eyes open. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't get your energy economics right, you're not going to be able to live the life that you choose. As a matter of fact, you're going to be back on your heels, getting the life that's coming at you, punching you in the face, and you're flinching because you can't handle it. Mm -hmm. And I learned this years ago in clinic. Um, when I would see a patient who didn't have the vitality to take on the recommendations, you know, people come in and it's like, okay, here's your MRI, here's your blood work, here's this, here's that, we found the answer, here's what we got to do. They don't do it. And you're like, hey, what the hell, man? You came to me, gave me all this money. I figured out what your problem was. We gave you a plan, you didn't do it. What's the problem? And it was always the ones that lacked the energy and the motivation to actually do anything in their lives. And whether it was going and digging up some underlying trauma, fixing their diet or whatever, if their energy economics were wrong, they, their life just never moved, right? And so energy became kind of a centerpiece in the work I was doing clinically. And, and, you know, and then it just kind of carried through as I realized it was kind of the elephant in the room. And you know, we all talk about wanting more energy but we'll do it in a way that actually becomes a, a net drain. How, you know, on how universal can you be in prescribing? Mean, how different are those energy economics from person to person? It occurs to me that there are people who famously, as you know, claim that they don't need to prioritize sleep and healthy eating, all, all that as much as others. You know, Donald Trump. <laughs> he's, he has avowed that he only needs four hours of sleep or less. We see him eating his KFC. I mean, to his credit, uh, a guy in his 70s, other than about with COVID, he he didn't spend too much time seemingly sidelined with sickness during his presidency. So, so does the need for energy change from person to person? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, we're all born with different genetics. We're all born in different circumstances. Um, there are very, very uh, unique elements to every single one of us. But, you know, for the most part, diet, exercise, sleep, mindset, detoxification, um, you talk to any good functional medicine doctor, man, all we, all we really need to do is look at all the lifestyle measures, figure out what's out of whack, get that resolved in the individual. And look, you might have, you know, ferritin levels because of some genetic thing. You might have X, Y, and Z, and those things get fine-tuned. But the things that need to get fine-tuned aren't necessarily infinite. There are systems that just need to come back online. And when they do so, the homeostatic mechanisms of the body kick in. And again, you have this kind of net profit of energy. If you're spending all your energy breaking down a cheese burrito, <laughs> you're not extracting enough calories versus what you're putting in to get it get it out it's just bad business but the joy that you get the the ebullient energy from the cheese burrito the burrito i'm trying to make the excuse it, for the cheese burrito it, it used to be man i wish i just can't eat the cheese anymore it punishes but, me, so, right? so do you do you have any specific rules like is there a, is there a low bar that uh, that a patient would you say everyone has to get this amount of sleep at least or no, do you, or no. is it just, it, 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 it depends. You know, if you wake up tired, you're not getting enough or there's something wrong. Right. I mean, we like to say six to eight hours for every person. We like to look at sleep hygiene. Right. 
It'd be like, well, you know, are you watching blue blue lights at night? Are you, um, you know, is your is your room too warm? Um, is your mattress too soft? I mean, all this kind of basic stuff that have to do with sleep hygiene. Are you having caffeine after 2 p.m.? Right. Um, and once you get all that stuff resolved, then we start talking about sleep quality. We start talking about deceleration rituals. Mm. Like if you're just like bang, bang, bang all day and then you jump into bed and like yell at yourself because you can't fall asleep, you know, that's that's an unreasonable expectation of a bi biological system. Right. And so, you know, there's, there's some good sensible living parameters around all that. And I think that um, ironically, most people don't take counsel in that because we get a pill to fix everything. And so the business model around allopathy and the, the medical model that has kind of swarmed right. the conversation um, is one that is harming humanity because it wasn't designed for chronic disease. It wasn't designed for what it's trying to teach or, f or fix. I want to come back to your book. I want to come back to focus and specifically with respect to uh, social media and screen time. I thought so much about that when I was reading this book. Uh, but let me get into a bit of your story first, uh, which will come as some revelation to me because I couldn't find a lot about your story in the research. I mean, it is surprising uh, gratifying, interesting, uh, to have an Iranian guy become the purveyor of Eastern Asian practices. Uh, tell, tell me what you were like as a kid, first of all, when your family, uh, if you could remember Iran before you left at three, but if not, when your family first came from Iran, how would you describe, uh, little Pedro Amjan before he evolved into the urban monk? Kind of a normal kid. I don't remember Iran. Um, I was three years old. I mean, what you think are memories are actually just like old photos in a photo album for the most part that you know, you're know you seeing. Um, but then, you know, grew up a, a relatively normal life. I do remember we moved around a lot. My dad was a civil engineer who then got into like construction and, you know, trying to pick up where we, you know, left off, you know, starting over and crap. And I remember moving a lot and being the only brown kid in a lot of white schools. So I had to learn how to fight. You know what I mean? Like if you're a girl, they don't do that. If you're a boy, you got to learn that. And so I, I, I developed uh, edge, right? To protect myself for the most part. And I also learned, you know, very quickly how to make friends and be, um, you know, good at that. So that um, fist fights, you know, fist fights are not what you want to be in, right? And so I got pretty good at the social, social animal thing um, growing up. And then at some point, you know, and I had the whole, you know, Persian dad thing where it's like, I'd finish my homework and my dad would be like, you know, I'm like, yo, I'm done. And he'd be like, so study some more. And so I just, I learned to, I learned to look busy because, you know, he was putting all his like immigrant vibes on me. And, um, so, I, you know, I, I got very good at looking busy, but then I realized how inefficient that was, um, right around high school. So from ninth grade on, I just, committed to getting straight A's. I was number one in my high school and, you know, on my way to being a doctor at UCLA. And then I got there and was like, ew, I don't, I don't want this. Right. I don't want, I don't want what I'm seeing here. It was, you know, I had the, I had the real, like one of my angels was a doctor who, you know, was a pretty miserable guy who I was, you know, interning with. And, um, you know, he was just putting people on morphine all day. And I'm like, here I am. I worked my ass off to get to this place in life and I don't want this guy's life. So now what? Right. Um, let, let me so get to creating. UCLA. Let me get to UCLA. T t two steps back though, yeah. talking about your dad and being the immigrant kid. Um, you know, my dad had this, I've j joked about it on the show before. My dad's mantra was please work harder. So just like you said, I could bring home, forget the A, the A plus. That is right. great. Please work harder. You know, like, and, yeah. and, and a byproduct of that becomes nothing's ever good enough. You know, you are you are not doing somehow enough, which is a, a weight that you have to carry around with you that possibly some of the white kids that you were going to school with that, you know, didn't necessarily have or, or depending on what their background was or how they were brought up. How did you seemingly escape that weight? You know, a lot of basketball and a lot of, you know, pre-UCLA, it was... I, I, I renegotiated the deal to say, if I get straight A's, you, you get off my back, right? And I got straight A's, but they didn't give me valedictorian because I had use and cooperation because I, was, I just became kind of a chippy dick, right? Like I just wasn't about to conform if they said you can't go to the bathroom or whatever it was. And so, you know, some, some attitude 
uh, emerged out of all that. But, you know, went to the parties and, and, and kind of developed a social life that was was fun right um in high school and 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 said listen my deal is so long as i bring you straight a's i'm you know i'm checking this thing off so i got them off the back but i never got them out of the psyche until i became much more aware of it right and that um requires some introspection that requires some work and you know i something led me to go do all this monk stuff and you know this jedi stuff and it took at least a couple of years of any of that before I even got down to the layer of self-awareness mm -hmm. to realize that as I was trying to relax, I had mental programming that your father and my father had obviously shared, which was you can never relax, keep going. Um, you know, you, if, if, you, if you stop, you sink. Right. And so, you know, I'm sitting here doing all this mindfulness practice, not realizing that unless I change the programming in my mind, I could I could breathe till the cows came home. It wasn't going to work. And then I started to realize what mindfulness and meditation and, and, you know, kind of personal development really meant, right? It's not about the techniques. It's about understanding the, the programs that are driving the system. In that moment where you, you make the big pivot in university, I mean, your parents, your Persian parents have to be happy with your success now, but, but getting there, now, had to be interesting at the very least. Uh, the young Persian prodigy boy going to UCLA, going to be a doctor, like a stereotypical Persian parent dream scenario. And you pivot and go into ancient Asian healing and things that are perceived, you know, I mean, uh, uh, incorrectly, but but as witchcraft or voodoo or something by our community uh, or by many communities. How did that go over? That was rough. <laughs> Right. I mean, they lost their shit. They're like, what are you talking about? What's wrong with you? Um, but there was there was this underlying je ne sais quoi that they could see and I could feel because I had already found something and I could feel I could feel energy coming out of my hands. You could see light coming out of my eyes like I had tapped into something at a very young age that was supernatural in some ways. Right. And they could they were like, what what happened to you? Like you could just, there was a visceral something that had come over their son that was a good thing. Like, you know, I was studying Sufism. I was studying everything, right? And they're like, oh, shit, he's going to be a spiritual tripper, right? And they, they begged and they pleaded. But I was like, listen, this just feels right. Trust me. I'm never going to ask you for money. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'll be okay. Um, did they, think it, was a, did they think it was a phase you were going through? They wished it was. Right. I remember at one point I was in India. Um, I was studying with the Dalai Lama, the Karmapa Lama. I, I spent like six or seven months in India going from ashram to ashram. And I had landed in Thailand. Um, I was like relaxing on a beach, reading Tolkien's books. And they were like, we're coming. And they like, they literally <laughs> flew to Thailand thinking they were going to like put me in a bag and rescue me. It's some sort of like parental intervention. And I'm just like, hey, you want a massage, right? Like, like, like enjoy Thailand. And and right. and they were like, damn, this guy's he's okay, right? He's okay. Like they thought they were gonna save me from some sort of weird cult, right? You know, right. that's all. They're they're all just you know they're trying to protect their kids. They flew all the way to Thailand though. That's this. They flew, that's, and to this day, it's the best vacation <laughs> of their life. <laughs> you, you know, I want to try something out on you, which I, I I really have no idea whether there is something to this, but I was thinking about you and thinking about your Iranian background. And thinking about how a lot of what we deal with on this show, you know, when we talk about diaspora and, and who we are, what our identity is as people of Middle Eastern descent, Persian descent, et cetera, living outside of Iran, it's a clash between East and West, right? Like growing up, I always joke about being a Nowarian because I, I felt Eastern, but I'm very Western. If you threw me on the streets of some city in Iran for most of my life, it'd be like, you know, what do I do here? And people would be like, who's this kid with the new wave haircut, <laughs> you know, or, or, or whatever. Uh, and yet... The Eastern Western thing, part of that is Iran and where we, our roots, our DNA is old civilization, right? It's, it's old world versus new world. And I wonder if there's some intersection of you coming from the old world, albeit 
not Buddhist or, you know, not Asian or not, you know, in the same way as the kind of, but if there's some intersection of the old world that you come from being Persian Iranian and the old world that you ended up finding uh, a place in, in Eastern medicine. Perhaps. Um, I can tell you that ancient cultures, traditional vitalistic cultures ring more true than the kind of primitive naivete of this kind of teenage adolescent, early adolescent culture that's still trying to like find its way. Um, I didn't grow up around a lot of family. Um, some of the things around the Persian culture that probably uh, threw me or made me avert were some of the kind of interdependencies and the he said, she saids and everyone kind of, you know, up in each other's business that I thought was um, less than useful, right? And then I married into that, which is a whole other story we could talk about. Um, but, um, you know, and, and the Chinese stuff, I don't know why it rang so true. It really, like, I was like, Whoa, I got nothing, right? I don't want to even learn to speak Mandarin. But when the first time I did Tai Chi, I knew I was home. And so, you know, what am I going to do, right? So I, I just, I, I, went, I went full on into it because it felt more real than anything I'd ever experienced. When did you know you really wanted to become a monk like, or some derivation of a monk? When did you really know? <sighs> when I was asked. So the, the Kung Fu master that I was uh, training with, I mean, I was just all in. I was doing it. And then he decided that he was going to do the monastic program for the first time in 20 years. And the old man was still alive. The grandmaster of my lineage was at another monastery um, visiting when the communists came to his temple, burned it down, killed everyone he knew and threw him in jail and whatever. And he got smuggled out to, uh, to San Francisco and then Los Angeles um, uh, by boat. And uh, so he had not taught any non-Chinese. And so basically they revived the lineage with a burned down temple here in America. And I was just studying all that stuff. And, you know, I was, I mean, I was early in my training but you could tell I was in, right? And so he, it was me and a bunch of black belts and he asked me, and before I could think about it, um, I was like, yeah, yeah, this is exactly what I want. Um, and you know, it was, it had its trials and tribulations. I was a normal kid. I mean, there's celibacy. There's all kinds of things that go along with that, that um, um, I didn't realize I'd signed up for until <laughs> it was too late. Um, but uh, all in all, it was a tremendous life altering experience. And why, forgive me if this is reductive, but why an urban monk? In other words, why not actually just move to the mountains of Nepal? Um, well, because our lineage didn't have a temple in the mountains of Nepal. They had burned it down in the, man the mountains of Canton. And so the old man was here and he was the last kind of vestige and he was going to hand the torch over of everything he knew to this next generation before it died. Um, and then I got letters of intro to the mountains of Nepal. And I spent plenty of time in the mountains of Nepal once I had kind of the foundation of my training. Um, but I was, I was, you know, I was living urban and doing all the monastic training. And then I had to decide if I was going to go mountain monk or fire monk, which is ascetic gone or take on a family and live in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I got kids, so you know which one I chose. And, and why did you make that choice? The, the latter choice? Yeah. In other words, I'm, I'm wondering if there's something more like rather than you famously being able to fuse these these worlds together. I mean, that's what you help to teach to people. That's why you're, you call yourself the, the, the urban monk. But it just, wouldn't it be easier to, if in a, in, a, in a purist kind of way to just be, you know, just stay on the mountain? 100%. I mean, I, I honestly think it, there's a couple experiences there. One is I think that like my Persian genes were screaming at me to like have babies and pay forward what my parents did for me. And like, I just grew up with a lot of love and a lot of, you know, just warmth. And so I've always, I always wanted to have children. So that was in opposition to the vows. Right. Um, but there was also something else um, being up there it felt a bit decadent. And I was 
you know, it's like I get to sit there and like, yeah, it was hard work. I mean, it's cold and you're like, you know, doing stuff and chopping wood and just all the things that go, go along with that. Mm -hmm. But it was just me. It was just me and my brain and my opportunity. And you get to a point where you're like, hey, man, I feel pretty good. And I feel pretty good every day. Um, and then I started to notice all the Westerners coming to visit the, the temples and everyone was running. They were like splashing on the beach of these Himalayan mountains, um, running from our world, the world that I had come from. And I started talking to the Babas and the Sadhus and the guys that, you know, I was with up there. I'm like, what is this? And they're like, yeah, this is, you know, this is what it is. Mm. Everyone thinks they're going to come up here and find God. And all they're trying to do is doink each other and hide from their, you know, their past. Mm -hmm. And it just, it started to become much, much more clear to me that there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. And if you want to solve the world's problems, then you go stand in the world. And um, as I, as I was talking to my teachers about that, they were all just kind of smiling, being like, we know you don't belong here. You, you go back to the world you came from and you heal it there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an easy decision. It's a lot easier being up there, man. It will not. I mean, it's so interesting that, that, that the image that just came to my mind is that of the folks who go, I don't want to take anything away from those who really feel it, but go to Bali uh, for a couple of months and go, you know, I have, uh, I'm here doing important meditation or something. And, and you kind of go, no, maybe, but you're also a rich kid who is on vacation in Bali. <laughs> like, <Right>. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, that, uh, and, and so I, I hear you and, and I've, I've always had this kind of um, difficulty with that. I, you know, you don't want to begrudge someone who's going and doing yoga in a beautiful place. What's wrong with that? But, but there is something about it that feels, can feel um, disingenuous. Especially if you go with your friends. Um, there are a lot of places where people take home there with them. And a lot of the, a lot of the problems I've seen emerge in those types of scenarios is I'm a guy from LA. I'm over here to, to add on a spiritual module to my personality. So I can say I'm spiritual, um, whether it's to get girls or whether it is, you know, to forgive myself for ripping off those guys or whatever it is. And it's an additive personality edifice instead of what these practices are designed to do, which is annihilate your ego and, mm -hmm. and bring you down to zero so that you could understand kind of the, the undercurrent of all life and all things and that everything you think you are is probably wrong, right? And so a lot of people are searching for their identity and looking to add an identity instead of destroy all sense of identity and, and find who they truly are. And, um, you know, it's not, and I don't want to fault the guys in Bali who are holding the retreats or the people in India that are trying to help these people. Um, it's just a spiritual malady of our time. And um, I don't want that to stop anyone who's listening from going to Bali and trying to find it, right. but do so with a grain of salt. It's always been here. It's not, it's not in Bali, it's in you. And Bali might give you a little bit of set and setting to help you find that, hmm. but the magic is always inside of you. That's beautifully said, I appreciate that. When did you know, Pedro, you wanted to bring these practices, the kind of thoughts you just shared to a, a general audience? <sighs> oh, 2015, what I had done is I started making films. I started, you know, I wrote my first book. Didn't really like the attention. I'm not like a look at me kind of guy. I'm not trying to get famous, any of that kind of stuff. Um, but what I started to see in the memes and the media was disgusting. And so a lot of the personal development work that people were espousing was to me the equivalent of, you know, selling sugar cereal to children, right? It was, it was all, it wasn't that it was just watered down and light. It was wrong. And it was going to lead to spiritual confusion and suffering. And I realized that a lot of the look at me gurus out there 
are just telling people what they wanted to hear mm -hmm. and really um, doing a disservice to humanity. And um, that's when I got called out to come out and, and kind of step up and talk this stuff. And it was never my intention. Like I didn't want to be that guy. Like I did this for me. Right. But then I, I came out and then the urban monk just blew up and it's in 30 languages and it just did things. And it was like, shit, here I am. Right. And, and you, you put yourself on a stage. Um, you better be willing to, to, you know, take it because then it kind of pulled me into a different life. Right? You were surprised by the success, the appetite for it. Yes and no. I mean, I did, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at understanding. Like I, I studied the game and I, you know, learned how to position it and all that and speak to people. My first book was much more monk than urban. Right. And then um, I realized that, you know, asking people to hike up a jagged cliff up a mountain to learn these things, you'll get three visitors. But if you walk into town and, and, and radiate your glow, everyone's going to say, who's that guy, right? And so I had to um, shift the perspective to help more people. And I realized that the, um, the people that were doing so were doing so in a way that wasn't quite ethical because they were entrapping people and being like, you're my student, I'm your guru and all this kind of crap, right? Dark crap. And so I, um, I did it. To make, I did it to be successful, right? And it was, right? So it wasn't surprising in that I put in the effort and I had the intent to mm -hmm, get it out mm -hmm. there, but then it just kept going, right? I mean, you've got to know that there are people uh, listening to this somewhere in the world right now who will, when we talk about artifice and stuff, will say, okay, this guy, uh, good on him, but he's built an industry, books, seminars, films, Docs, apps, podcasts, lectures. Uh, y you have to know that people are skeptical about folks who are successful in bringing so-called, you know, alternative healing, Eastern uh, healing to, and wisdom to large audiences. So how do you respond when someone, when naysayers claim you do this, say, for big bucks? It takes big bucks to get in front of millions of people, right? Um, look, if it weren't for bucks um, and the need to generate money to do things in the world, I'd be living in the woods with my family, right? Like I don't, I don't care about the money. I never have, but doing the things that I do and scaling the films that I, it's just, you know, costs a couple million bucks to make a film, right? So either you're going to sit there and talk shit in a corner somewhere, or you're going to, you know, generate a couple million bucks, not borrow it and not beg for it so that people tell you what your film should be about. And then you make the films that you want to make, right? And so, you know, I think a lot of people, I had to get over this. I had a big thing with this because, you know, when you, when you grow into these kind of spiritual communities, you start to develop an aversion for money, hmm. right? I came from the Persian community, which is, you know, look at my fucking Lamborghini or whatever, whatever the hell people are showing off to each other. It's a very BMW, BMW, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right? It's, it's just, it's a very ostentatious, showy, peacocky culture, right? And then I went to like, you know, monk land where I learned all this stuff, but, and it, and it wasn't the monk stuff. It was the people and the culture around it that was a bunch of like kind of confused communist um, if you're into spiritual stuff, then you can't be into money. You can't do both. And then when I came back and became an urban monk, it took me two years of just hell trying to reconcile a belief system that wouldn't let my businesses do anything. And I couldn't help the people I wanted to help because I was always worried about money. And when I realized that, you know, you might as well just make money and be big and large and, and use money to do good, all that shit went away. And so I think there's a lot of that kind of intrinsic stuff. And I'm not like, you know, the stuff I do isn't all about like put cameras on Pedram to be like, look how cool that guy is. I go to David Perlmutter. I go to Mark Hyman. I go to the best in class people and ask them their advice on how, you know, other my viewers should get healthy. And so it's always been about sp putting the spotlight on the people that deserve it not necessarily, you know, building my brand. It, that that kind of just happens, but I've never been a build my brand kind of, I don't care, right? I'm just trying to help. And, and it, I, you know, sorry folks, that costs money, right? It just costs money to do these things at scale. What about other monks? I feel, I feel like I've always held someone who's a monk 
to a higher standard. I, I've always thought, you know, there's so much virtue and integrity. I remember being in Cambodia two or three years ago and, and, uh, there was a monk sitting near me and just on his iPhone laughing. And I was just like, this guy, they're just humans like, like everybody else, you know, they're human beings. And so I'm, maybe they are capable of jealousy or backbiting as well. I mean, have you had monks who, uh, people who do, who are in this practice, um, approach you and, and y- y- with some kind of, who are you to be teaching this to the masses? Yeah, sure. Um, and you know, I've had conversations with them and they backed off because they realize I'm not, you know, who they're projecting me as being right. And I've also, there's people in the industry right now that are plagiarizing my work, right. Um, you know, people that I had to, you know, cease and desist letters for calling themselves the urban monk and people that are just marketers dressed as monks. And so it's, it's like any other industry, man. It's just wild, wild west. And there's a lot of, any idiot can put on an orange gown <laughs> and pretend to be this, right? I just wear t-shirts, right? And I, I de-emphasize it, right? Like, what am I going to dress like a Chinese guy? Like I'm a Persian guy. And so I'm just a guy. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's all kinds of things and, you know, there's angry haters and there's, you know, beautiful people. And, you know, and I, I got to say some of the some of the worst stuff I've seen has been less overt, but more dangerous where there I won't ne- mention any of the like councils, but there's these like leadership councils and all these things where it's just like, oh, Pedro, I, you know, you've been nominated to come on to this council and like be part of this like spiritual leader thing. Hmm. And it's it's a hierarchical cabal of people trying to control the messaging in the personal development space. And it's like, it's, it's, it's like a guild Hmm. and there's all sorts of like weird junior high shit amongst these names that I won't even mention that you'll all know. And, you know, people take cigarette breaks outside and they're all, you know, they're, they're cheating on each other with their wives. It's just unbelievable what I've seen. And so, you know, just take everything with a grain of salt. People people in uh, orange robes are people, and they're going to laugh at a TikTok thread just like anyone else. Let me come back to your new book. Uh, focus is the name of it. Why do we have so much trouble with focus? Because it's being mined right out of your forehead. I mean, if you think about the attention economy, you think about 50 years of neuroscience that has all been designed to grab you on your impulsivity. Um, There's people that have done very specific work to find the dopaminergic activity of young boys to get them addicted to video games. All, same guys like BJ Fogg and his you know lab out of uh, Stanford, you know, are so proud of this. It's like you know, it's unbelievable what these people are proud of, and and they've de- developed addictive technologies to keep people scrolling and stuck in their social media, you know, you know, news alert, live, live, this, live, that, like all this stuff you turn on CNN, you can't turn it off because you think like something is right around the corner every second. It's designed as such. And your attention is being monetized by advertisers and, and, you know, eyeballs online um, and being pulled right out of your life into someone else's objectives, right? And as if it wasn't bad enough before, it's getting worse. And the part of the brain that gets empowered with meditation and mindfulness, the prefrontal cortex, you know, it's fighting with the limbic system. It's fighting with constant messaging, saying the world isn't safe. They're coming to get you. It's the Arabs. It's the Persians. It's the this. It's the that. All this stupid messaging that keeps people in fear Mm -hmm. all the time keeps you out of the part of your brain that says, Jun, you know, it's great to see you, but I can't get a beer tonight because I'm hanging with my kids. That part of the brain that would need to be present at that moment to take us back to the beer is the part of the brain that's on a backslide because I'm in my amygdala and I'm in my animal brain trying to figure out how the hell I'm going to survive on this crazy, scary rock mm. called planet Earth. And so all of the things that are happening in media are designed as such because when we are on tilt, as my poker players would say, mm. um, then we make impulsive decisions. You need you need those shoes to to attract a nice Persian wife. She needs that purse to you know show that she's with a guy that's worth being with. All this stupid messaging that gets carried in on the you know you need an attractive mate. You're not a safe animal circuitry. 
that's all very, very cleverly designed. And it pulls us right out of the parts of our brain that have us focusing on our lives, our priorities, our health, you know, our immediate surroundings. Let me ask you about the, first of all, by the way, our beer date is taking a beating during this interview. I feel I, like. I totally. I, I, we need to get I, a beer I'm, just I'm to not like, a priority yeah. anymore. I'm simply not a priority to you anymore. <laughs> I, I'm not getting watered. Uh, um, let me ask you about the paradox of screen time. It, seem, it seems to me that a lot of this is focus in the contemporary context. Uh, has to do with social media and screen time. And it, it's a funny thing when it comes to social media because people, people, I feel like people tend to convince themselves that they're doing something for their career, you know, by, by being on social media. Like it's work of some sort, when on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, when for the most part, it's, it, it isn't unless you actually work in social media, unless your gig is to be an influencer and that's it. And then on the other hand, folks are under the belief that social media is like an escape or a holiday from work. And you've argued that it isn't really restful time to be sitting scrolling through Twitter or something. So talk to me about that paradox of screen time. Well, I mean, I have a chainsaw in the back of my truck. I drive a truck now, by the way, because I'm a country boy all of a sudden. Um, and I don't use that chainsaw often, but I cut down eight trees a couple months ago that were like dead on my property. And it was the best tool I could have had. I pulled it out. I used it. I oiled it back up. I put it back. Look, I mean, I love my phone for phone calls. I love my phone for checking email when I'm on a, a train or a plane. And it is a very useful tool when you're using it appropriately. But what's happened is we've unconsciously been pulled into all of these, you know, viral memetics, as you're alluding to, of thinking somehow this is good for my career or, you know, this is downtime. It's not. More information isn't downtime. That's like eating spaghetti and saying, I'm digesting my meal right now. You got to stop eating the spaghetti so that your, your system can start digesting. And, and mm. what's happening is we have news, information, emotional, spiritual indigestion from so much information coming in. And like, you know, yeah, I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with watching some, some guy fall, you know, uh, off his bike on TikTok, I guess, right? But it's designed to say, okay, now the next eight seconds needs me going to the next one and the next one and the next right. one. And it keeps serving right. you until, I mean, think about, I mean, I'm 45 years old. I, I have X amount of heartbeats that I've already had, you know, had the pleasure of enjoying here on planet Earth. And I probably have, you know, a couple hundred million more, whatever the math is, and then I'm done. How many of those does TikTok deserve versus Sophia or Soul or my wife out there? Right. And we just we think of it as downtime. But real downtime is what a short bazan, you know, like go take a nap, go, go enjoy a walk in the woods, mm -hmm. go exercise, go do something that integrates you mind, body and soul and get out of this. Cra it's so insidious. But and once I you're, as it. you know, once you're in the mindset, it actually, we're socialized to believe we're falling behind if we're not, I mean, FOMO or fear of missing out has, has grown alongside the skyrocketing use of social media in the last decade or two, as you know. So how much of a problem is FOMO in our, in our lives? I mean, it's, it's the lever of the handle that keeps chucking us into the cauldron, right? And like me, I actually have like a, a social brand and everyone's like, why aren't you on Clubhouse? You need to be on Clubhouse. And I'm like, man, if I had time for Clubhouse, I'd go exercise. You are on Clubhouse. Whatever. You are on Clubhouse. I am, but I'm like, I, you know, I've shown up a few times. I've done like maybe 15 talks and I've limited it to like work hours where I'm like, okay, you know what? I'll do an hour on Clubhouse twice a week and do my podcasts there. But I have like friends that are trying to ping me in when I'm at my dinner right. table with my family. Right. I'm like, dude, no, right? no, I don't care what you people are talking about, right? Like I'm sitting here with my kids. This is a terrible example of my priorities to my children is to sit there and make myself available for a bunch of strangers on some app versus being there and asking them, what's, how's your day? What do you tell right? people? I, I'm so glad you, I actually wanted to specifically ask you about Clubhouse because I see you're on Clubhouse and this has infected <laughs> many of our lives who, you know, for those of us who somehow are in communications or this type of thing. It, it's likely, I think, too early to, to, 
to properly understand how this new platform is going to enrich or mess with our lives. Uh, and I and I suspect it'll go in the, the the avenue of toxicity very soon. You know, in terms of it'll just be taken over by corporate, you know, folks, and and they'll be, uh, uh, you know, the same people who are big on Twitter or whatever will will be big there, and and it'll have the same implications that Facebook has. But regardless of all of that, maybe it won't. Maybe it's revolutionary. It does occur to me that if people are in chat rooms all day talked a bit about it on this show there are people we know who are in chat rooms all day that there are other things that they're not doing like they're not reading or they're not resting or they're not focusing on any other area of personal growth or whatever how do you if i come to you as a and i'm begging you to to, to give me a prescription how, how do you approach what appears to be the addictive nature of something like clubhouse yeah, well, I think your your first question was really the crux of it, which is a lot of this is culturally predicated on a, a, a level of FOMO that makes um, us always feel behind and our parents who can't figure out the iPad we bought them antiquated, right? Where you're like, hey, Baba, just hit this button, right? And, and like, it just moves so fast that you're like, I'm going to be left behind in the dust. I'm going to be rendered irre- irrelevant. And then someone's going to blah, 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 right? And then you just go for a hike and you come back and you realize you actually feel better. And then you go on a date with your wife and turn off your phones and maybe go dancing. And you're like, wow, that was one of the best nights ever. And you start to weigh the real events mm-hmm. against these bullshit fake approximations of reality. And you start to feel the difference between vitality and fatality. It's like the matrix. You're just getting sucked into this thing. It was Sunday. Um, I took a nap. It was the first time I've taken a nap in a long time. I'm like, hey, I'm going to take a nap. My wife comes running in to like grab my phone to put me in some room because there was some room that had like 6,000 people in it. And she's like, you should be here. The Iranian room. And I'm like, wait, what? You just woke me up out of a fucking nap to put me in some... (laughs) Turn that thing off. Yanichi, like, I don't want it. I don't want it. I was enjoying a Sunday nap, which is like, I would pay $10,000 for a good Sunday nap at this point in my life. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it was the big Iranian room. Uh, yep. I, I saw it I, and I just went, I can't. I'm not going to, because then I'm going to go there and maybe they'll pull me up and I'll wonder what I have to say. And like, it's just, I don't, you know, I, I, it's too much. It's too much. It, it feels like too much. I agree with you. But it's so interesting that your wife would have that instinct because to her credit, she knows that there is cultural status and cachet that is, that is, tied up in this shit so it's like you know i want my husband to have more followers because that'll be more gigs and he'll sell more books and you know so he's got to go in the big iranian room right now uh right i mean and and you had the wherewithal to say no but obviously you're still negotiating with this because you do go on clubhouse and you do you do your talks there and you are on instagram and all of that yeah i mean well let's think about it like i have team that posts on instagram I have podcasts that I will do much like this, where it's just like, I'm just going to talk to some dude and have a nice conversation. And then you guys run with it from there. Like I've refused to be like the look at me selfie guy because I don't care. Right. And the only social media I'm willing to do is hold conversations with people that are interesting and then let my team run around and post them because, you know, I think they're, you know, vitally interested in keeping themselves paid. Right. And, and so my deal with social media is, Hey, look, I'll do a few here and there during work hours and you guys run and post them and syndicate them and whatever. And I'm going skiing. Hmm. I live on a ski mountain. You know, and I, I really enjoy my my family and my life and my wife. And so for me, social media is a tool for our business because I do do films and books to like get the messages out there. But I just, frankly, I pay people to do it, man. I don't like, I'm not interested in spending all my time there. I was going to say the takeaway seems to be for, for all of you listening out there, make sure you have a team of people that you can pay to, to deal with your social media. Honestly, all you need is one Hoş millennial. It. <laughs> all you need is a millennial. I mean, I have a team because I've grown my business over the years, but just get some freaking kid who like grew up with that circuitry like in their brain. <laughs> and I, you know what I mean? I just, these kids just do it naturally and I, right, I don't right, care. Right, I just right. don't. I want to end off by asking you about um, 
something about identity, about being Iranian and some of the areas that you, you cover. Um, Pedro, let me ask you about trauma, first of all. You've written a lot about it and you talk a lot about it. And I am of the belief that Iranians, whether you think about your parents or your wife's family or uh, Iranians around the world, deal with a lot of trauma issues. Our, our recent history over the last half century, war, revolution, censorship, exile, executions, can, can, can certainly be that prescription for traumatized minds. What do you see in your own family? How important is it to understand how our histories have brought us here in grappling with collective trauma? I mean, I don't even know where to start with that. We, I mean, from the beginning of the days where the Russians and then the, you know, the British and I mean, Iran's been just like the punching bag for colonial powers for a very long time. And, you know, we've got our classes of suck ups and then we got our people that felt marginalized and then, you know, the, the pendulum swung. And look, I mean, I had uncles that were machine gunned to death during the revolution. I mean, I had family that was killed in the Iran Iraq war. Um, and, you know, and all that stuff. And then it's, you know, we just did this 10 part series on trauma, which was very, very provocative. And even then, like here I am a guy who's spent his life introspectively contemplating stuff. And so many of these things that I had just kind of brushed aside started coming up. Right. It's like, when the hell was it cool to be Iranian? Like, you know, our parents got spit at when we moved here. Right. We were called terrorists and hostage takers and all this kind of crap. Yep, yep. All the while having to check off white Caucasian on every form. Right. And it was never OK. Right. Like I and so, you know, a lot of my personality grew around being chippy and, and kind of sarcastic and, and witty and, and, and quicker than the other guy because you found ways to deflect that energy and, and make people laugh and be like, oh, he's okay, right? Instead of having to fight your way out of a room. Um, but if you look back at that as a little boy, man, that's all trauma. That's all trauma. And it's, you know, I'm hyper vigilant about it. Like we pulled our kids out of a private school. You know, all these boys were rough and tumble, but my kid was always, you know, the guy in trouble. And mm -hmm. I'm like, you're fucking racist, right? You're not allowed to do that. You are not allowed to do that with my son. And I brought up a big stink because my parents didn't know. We had to fight for ourselves, right? They were just figuring out, they didn't even speak English, right? And so I think we all... We all collectively need to heal. I, I think that's also not arbitrary that guys like Hola Kui, like, you know, are like superstars in, in our parents' generation and all that. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, things under the rug that are coming out. And I think Iranians um, can learn a lot by becoming more introspective, more trauma-informed and learning about their past and, and becoming better citizens, better humans. Right. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for our culture to show leadership and, and skill in leadership internationally as an ancient culture who's gone through this. But it's not going to happen by, you know, flashing our frickin cars in Beverly Hills and doing all the ostentatious mm -hmm. garbage that um, our culture is also being, you know, kind of showy about. Right. Like we have such deep thinkers. We have such Roshan fix. And then we have all this like weird, you know, buzzy crap that people, you know, um, but we've, uh, we've had, gravitate towards. We, we've had psychologists, Persian psychologists, uh, I'm thinking of a woman who actually is a psychologist in Iran, a uh, pretty well-known one and, and, and one who was in LA and both of them said, this is historically, this will come as no surprise to you, of course, or any, most people listening, but historically Persians have been very reticent to even go there, to even go to therapy. You know, it's not something we do, right? Yeah. It's a, as you say, sweep it under the rug. Don't talk about it. We're fine. You know, uh, uh, I mean, you'd say stiff upper lip if that expression hadn't been stolen by uh, the, the, the British, you know, but that's, that's the, that's the idea. And so I wonder how, Persians who find out that you're Persian, if they don't already know, um, think about you. You must be a curiosity to uh, some folks in our community. Yeah, I mean, I've never, I've never denied my ethnicity. I think we were talking about this offline. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm quick to say what what comes to mind, and I have some family in Iran, and I was trying to, you know, be protective of of them. So I, you know, have reserved my sharp wit and my opinions 
of certain things um, to off air environments for, you know, other people's safety. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, Pedram is as Iranian of a name as, as you could find. <laughs> yes. Right. And, you know, I'm no, I'm not Peter. So it's there. I've, I'm proud of my heritage. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm also not the guy that like I grew up in uh, very white environments being Persian, but I didn't grow up like even when I went to UCLA, I wasn't like hanging with like the, you know, cliques of Persians in Kirchhoff Hall and just, just it's we're Persians and they're not right. like, right. I, you know, I was always been an international guy. So I have never identified with the clickiness of our culture. And um, I, I don't think I don't feel like an outsider with that, but it also doesn't make me gravitate towards like, you know, remembering all these people's names and like going to the parties and you know, you know what I mean? Like I just, I, there's a lot that goes into being a hyper social Persian and I just don't care enough. But I love the story. I love the arc of the story. Pedro uh, grows up with Persian parents who come to America, goes to UCLA, almost becomes uh, the, a traditional doctor, uh, re rebels, goes east, China, India, go, Jigong, a master, and then ends up coming to America and marrying an Iranian girl. <laughs> Ain't that a bitch? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, the you chickens marry came home to roost. In a lot of ways, right? <laughs> she's the first Iranian I ever dated, and I married her. Um, wow. And she's just adorable. She's an exquisite human being, and in a lot of ways, she was my kind of re-entry back into the culture. She's very Persian. Like she came here when she was like sixteen, and you know, Esfahan, and you know, like they're all up in each other's business. Like, you know, she's, she's on the phone with some Dai or someone all the time. And I just, I'm not wired that way, but I respect it. And I just, it's, I, I'm like a, I'm almost like a anthropological observer of it now where I'm like, wow, that is really interesting. How do you have any time for you when you're so in, entrapped in everyone else's like, you know, business? It's, it's just a very, very different um, interconnected culture. And how does her Isfahani family uh, deal with uh, the fact that she decided to marry an, the urban monk and live in Deer Park, Utah. Deer Valley, Utah. <laughs> Deer, Deer Valley. We, um, you know, it, it, we lived in Orange County for a while. We lived in LA for a while. And then finally I was like, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of the volume of the um, kind of interactions of everyone being in your business all the time. And I wanted my kids to grow up in a place that had more tree. My, my son's already like, they're, they're ready to like, they're, they're recruiting him for the Olympics in skiing. He's six. Like I, my kids are doing ex knock wood, exquisite things because they have time to do things that are awesome instead of asking for apps on the phone. Like the, the lifestyle in Southern California was making me sick to my stomach. Mm -hmm. And people were focused on things that I didn't feel were important. And people were busy going to dinner with each other, talking about the last dinner <laughs> that they had and the next trip they're taking together. And there was never a, a conversation of substance. And so it was, it was just very vacuous. And I had to basically say, listen, I love you. I love them. I love, you know, all of this. I'd like to be two states apart from all of it. <laughs> And it's, and so far it's been, it's been great because we love them. We miss them, but I don't need to be in that every day. I, I read books. I write books. You don't have time for that when you're in a busy Iranian, um, dore, if you will. Is there like a, a Khuraki store where you can get the Somal in Deer Valley, Utah? Or? Dude, down the hill in Salt Lake city, there's Persian stores. You, you can order everything online now. <laughs> like my wife actually cooks. Like we had Gorma Sabzi the other night. Like, I, you know, I'm not missing any of that. Um, and it's in that part's been great, you know, except the, the polo, right? Like it's really hard to be fit and eat polo all the time. Um, but you know, just, we, we have the, my, my parents were here for three weeks. They come and visit and then they go. Um, but it gives us a little bit of, like, there's something about the American culture and like creating some space and boundaries that I think our culture can learn from as well. Mm -hmm. We're way too up in each other's business. And I can't, I cannot do what I do with the amount of codependency and lack of personal time hmm. that Persian families give each other. 
I mean, look, uh, uh, let's be real here. I mean, uh, you're, you're infiltrating. You've gone, uh, you've gone to the whitest state in America, uh, except <laughs> for maybe Montana. <laughs> and, and you're, you're carrying the flag for us, brother. I get it. You're, That's you're, it. you know, people don't know this is part of the grand plan, the, the Persian takeover and, uh, uh, Godspeed. Um, <laughs> Before I let you go, you know, you, you, I loved the imagery earlier when you talked about being 45 and the heartbeats and you have so many heartbeats left. You've, you've accomplished so many heartbeats already. Um, I guess you're about halfway. I don't know. You, tell, tell me where you see yourself, where the urban monk sees him on his journey. I, I don't know when we're, when I'm going to go, but I'm living, I'm doing, my, my grandpa just died at 104 um, mm. of COVID actually, oh. um, but he would have made it to 106 probably. Um, I don't know. I mean, with good genes and good lifestyle, you're still not guaranteed anything. So I'm trying to enjoy every day it's in front of me. And when it snows, I'm skiing. The career trajectory, where do you feel like you're at on that journey? Kind of, I just wrote another book. I got another book coming in like four months. I've, I've, this last couple of years, I've, I've hatched a lot of eggs. Um, and so I have two or three more films that we're finishing right now. And then um, my plan is to kind of press pause for a little bit, see if the kids want to learn Italian, go to Italy for a year, um, and just kind of see from there. It's very easy to be a perpetual creator. And so we've been... Um, just cranking. And I think in the next couple of years, I'm going to kind of slow down and, 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 you know, just take a sabbatical for a little bit. Mm. Um, I've said enough. I don't feel like writing any more books for a while. Um, and, um, you know, just see what the world brings. I'm very interested in, um, carbon sequestration. I'm working with a couple funds that are, um, basically proving that green energy makes more sense than, than petroleum and, and scaling some of those solutions. So, you know, I, I think I'll spend the, the latter half of my life working on global ecology, energy solutions, cleaning up, you know, kind of supply chains and stuff like that and doing things that are meaningful. I mean, there's, I've done whole movies on this, but you know, there's 200 something um, chemicals in the, a baby's umbilical cord blood when they're born that shouldn't be there. And so, you know, the species is heading in the wrong direction and, you know, someone's got to do something about it. God's given me these, you know, these skills. Maybe I'm the guy, like you, I'll, I'll jump in there. You have no shortage of ideas. I, I suspect, I, I can't really see you just hanging out on a hammock somewhere uh, for the final 20 or 30 years. I think you'll- No, no, you, no. You, I, you, you, you're good on a hammock for about a year and then you're getting cagey, right? <laughs> um, and, and so look, even as a monk, like, you, you, you know, you take a break and you jump back in. My whole thing is I love what I do. Like I'm not- yeah. I might be physically tired at the end of a day, but I'm not morally or emotionally or spiritually beat because I'm, I'm doing the things that matter to me. Right. And so why would you stop doing those? Maybe you just slow down. Maybe you change your cadence a little bit, but I mean, if you're doing work that's meaningful to you, keep doing it. I'm so grateful for this, man. I, this, this show is predicated upon, uh, exploring, uh, I mean, it's about a lot of things, but one of them is, is exploring the stories of those of us who have this bizarre connective tissue based on this growing diaspora of millions of folks who are of Iranian descent, but don't live in that country anymore. And that there really is a connective tissue that, that somehow connects us in one way or another. And it's always so fulfilling if surprising sometimes to hear new stories and yours is, uh, is a golden one. I'm so grateful again for the time you've given us. Thanks for doing this. Thank you so much. It was really enjoyable. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Pedram Shojai, founder of Well.org and the Urban Monk Academy, author of the bestseller, The Urban Monk. His latest book is called Focus, Bringing Time, Energy, and Money into Flow. Pedram Shojai joined us from Deer Valley, Utah today. on for
for Groovy Shy, Captain Reza, and the fabulous Keon. I'll tell you something. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. That was uh, that was very interesting. I don't know. Uh, do I? I don't know if I agree with everything. All of his prescription. I love the garden metaphor. Uh, I love what he had to say about. It. I love him. How how direct he was there about Clubhouse. No, I'm not going <laughs> on. And I mean that was uh, that was really enjoyable. Really glad to have Pedro on the show. Uh, Captain Reza, you're nodding. You were yeah, enjoying that. I loved it. I loved it. I really like him. I love his perspective on life and everything. And I, I quite agree with um, a lot of his point of views. I lived in Thailand for eight months, and and I saw monks like smoke in the street. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, like buy chips from grocery store, yeah. just live like a normal life. And and it's th- and the first time I saw it, actually, I, I was surprised too. I'm like, aren't they supposed to just be meditating <laughs> somewhere? Right, and right. it was it's it's, it's it's very it's very different from the perspective that most people have of um, spirituality in that part mm-hmm. of the world, essentially. And I really, really enjoyed it. It kind of tied in Shia, I thought, a little bit with what um, uh, Hannah Shahnavaz, what we were talking about mm-hmm. for a couple of episodes with, with her and Christopher Zayi about slowing down in life and, mm-hmm. and really appreciating... Um, trying to to not just feed into the currency of speed and and uh, it's not exactly what Pedro was talking about but it feeds into the same idea of uh, he's got you know he was talking about I've got this many heartbeats left in my life do I want to be spending that time scrolling through Twitter and Instagram uh, or or with my daughter or with my wife or going on a hike or being healthy or yeah. yeah the notion of meditation generally uh, it helps people to slow down i mean we have to practice meditation and do you meditate Shia? i medi- i i don't meditate like the uh, regular person mm-hmm. sitting there you smoke Actu- a big joint and watch <laughs> the simpsons <laughs> that's your no Same thing, no, really. no, <laughs> no actually uh, it's been t- a couple years that i've noticed that the best meditation for me is to uh, practicing scales, oh. simple scales, not music. Just ah. bop, 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 bop. Yeah, that's quite beautiful. Like uh, playing the piano or a keyboard doesn't feel like work to you, even though it's associated with your work. Uh, yeah, sometimes it it's work, but uh, uh, it's not meditation. Some uh, all, all the time, mm. but when I practice, especially scales in a very repetitive thing, I mean da 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 da. Yeah. it's it's my meditation. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Hmm. Kian? Kian Docht? <laughs> you know, I enjoyed that from beginning to end. I can hmm. honestly say I was like listening in, with intention and just took back a lot from that. Um, he's different. He's a Persian monk that, uh, you know, uh, he's an urban monk. He is what mm-hmm. he, he claims to be. And so he um, talk, talks like a sailor? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's not. I, mean, isn't that I guess that's the urban part he's of not the what urban you would monk. Say, yeah. 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 I usually despise those motivational speakers. I think they're such, um, I think they're bullshit. You know, the, oh. let's put it how it is. But he... He's, he was so real. He's, you know, he's saying it like it is. A lot of those people um, claim that they're enlightened and they try to force feed um, their views on life and profit from that. And, you know, he's straight up about it. Like, listen, you need to make money in this world. That's the reality of it. But um, he's doing it with intention. So I mm-hmm. think that's, mm-hmm. that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you again to Pedro and Shojay. Well, we're going to put up the uh, the full video of that interview at some point, too, at rookmedia.com because we were shooting it while we were doing it. Uh, for now, uh, it's on this episode, but uh, look, check our platforms in the next couple of days. We'll put up video for that, too. It's Thursday, and you got to know what that means. She is a dear friend, a diaspora blend, a gym fanatic, and a kook who can be erratic. Lovable, smart, funny, and on a journey to discover what we actually discovered. Here we go, Batchaha. It's all Persian to us with Kian Nademi. Well, Kian, what do you have for us this week? What I'm about to reveal will blow your minds. Brace yourselves. This piece of information could start a war amongst the nations. Families torn apart, children screaming in the streets over this divine creation fit for the gods. It's madness, blasphemous even, (laughs) but alas, it's the truth. I tell you, it's the truth. Do we need drum rolls for this? (laughs) Forget blood diamonds. This is the jewel of the world. 
what is widely known to be invented by the Italians, actually has Persian origins. You're joking. I'm talking about that juicy, delicious, warm, fluffy, doughy goodness we eat in the mornings, afternoons, or 3 a.m. after a drunken rager. It's the most popular food consumed around the world, recognized by every human being on Earth. Can you guess what it is? Bread. Close. Cheese. Good. Now no. together. <laughs> Bread and cheese. <laughs> yes, I want pizza. Have? Pizza. Yes, Whoa. yes, yes. By the way, is pizza the most popular food in the world? Uh, I looked it up, and yes, in fact, it oh, is. It's. Uh, I, I forget it. what the numbers are, but it's the most consumed know, food man. around the world. Isn't that That's interesting? That's crazy. You are going to start a war. I, I guarantee. <laughs> well, let me let me unravel this a little bit. Can we just go back to the episode bit? where I had some? <laughs> we go back to the episode where I had some of that Persian pizza, and they were putting ketchup all over it. Though. <laughs> <laughs> These Persians. I mean, that was that. I don't know what that shit was. That wasn't pizza. It wasn't that. <laughs> so the yeah. oldest version of pizza that ever existed comes from Persia. Wow. Modern pizza has origins from Italy, but the history of pizza goes much further back. Mm -hmm. So to give you guys some background, a few weeks ago, a fan of the show by the name of Ali Sharma sent me a, uh, a YouTube video of this show called Ancient Recipes. And in this uh, episode, she was cooking up the most ancient form of pizza, and it came from ancient Persia. Oh. So I, I, I was like, this can't be. So I looked into it, mm -hmm. and it turns out to check right. Wow. You know? And like the same concept, we would there'd be a dough, and on top of it, you put yep. probably not tomato sauce, but they, they no, would so they tomatoes, put cheese? Yes. Uh, well. Yeah. So, what's the definition of a pizza to you? Well, I, I well, not something with ketchup, first of all. But, <laughs> exactly. but I know that's going to offend most of our audience because yeah. they're used to it. I, well, definition of a pizza would be, I guess, some kind of dough. Some mm -hmm. kind of, and I mean, here we associate it with tomato sauce, but mm -hmm. it would have some cheese, yes. maybe some so, mushrooms or pepperoni. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like a bread with uh, cheese cooked on top of it with toppings on okay, top of it. That, right, that is right. the definition of a pizza that I'm putting out there. All right. Yes. So it was the 6th century BC as history laid fate. The path to war, exclaimed Darius the Great. Soldiers were marching on the path to glory. A long way to go, oh, what a story. <laughs> on they marched till the stomach started to growl. <laughs> when can we eat? A soldier yelled with a scowl. <laughs> they stopped where they were and started a fire, preparing their shields to fulfill their desire. Yeast, flour, and salt together they mixed, flatly laid out with cheese affixed, mm -hmm. adding some dates to finish the look, oh. then on to the fire it's ready to cook. Out it came as the soldiers grew hasty, away they chewed a pizza oh so tasty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you heard that right. At the height of the Persian Empire during the reign of Darius the Great in the 6th century BC, soldiers cooked pizza on their shields. Oh. A pizza covered with cheese and dates. And if you think dates Four is ridiculous, then what do you call pineapple on a pizza? That is the most atrocious <laughs> thing you could ever commit to a holy pizza. But alas, it's the truth. Pizza comes from Persia. And so it was always assumed to be an invention by the Italians. But as it turns out, the world's most beloved culinary creation was in fact invented by the Persians. My friends, it's all Persian to us. <laughs> Can you believe it. it? That's crazy. Mm. <laughs> That's crazy. I have a feeling my Italian friends are just going to hand it to me after this. Uh, <laughs> somehow it makes sense to me, actually. Uh, that that yeah. uh, I mean, I also think it's one of those things where we've found <laughs> a way to claim this. That, uh, but that's great. I, I'll take pizza. You know, mm. you know what they, you know what they call pizza in New York? What's that? Pie. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Really? Like, yeah. Just pie. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. You yeah, want to yeah. go get a pie? Yeah. yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Isn't that huh? cool? They cook pizza on their shields. That's so. It's cool. Fascinating yeah. to me. I was I was waiting for you to explain that it's about uh, the way we rode horses in war <laughs> with our <laughs> high heels and trousers. It's funny, all our inventions came from going to war, attacking the, the Greeks, yeah, yeah, or something. Yeah, <laughs> That's That's very funny. interesting, very interesting. Thank you, Keon. Uh, uh, any any other comments from the the cheap seats there? Uh, <laughs> No, it's just as soon as she said dates, it reminded me of when you, you confused Senjet with dates in that Nooruz video. I know, it's so funny. I know, I'm so embarrassed about that. My mother, <laughs> our Nooruz video, if you guys yeah. haven't seen it out there, there's a port, uh, 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 we're, we've got, we're in front of the half scene, and mm -hmm. uh, um, Shai at one point, point picks up a Senjet piece of, you know, what do you call it? 
A Sanjet. No, that's true. A Sanjet. What's the English word for that? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I don't know, but, I, and I, I didn't know, well, nor did you. You were like a... And my mom, she was just like, I can't believe all these years I've been putting the half scene out. You don't know what Sanjed is. And I'm like, I know, I know. I, I was so, I felt so bad. I mean, she was really, she was mortified, you know. <laughs> Listen, what me, is and, you, this, you me know? and you have an excuse. We didn't grow up in Iran. These guys, I know. these, these people. Defense, <laughs> and a number of the people who are just like, you guys don't know why it's half to like, they're like, and I was like, I was expecting Shia and Reza and Savvy Reza. Roham, his name, his Savvy's in his name, you know. And I mean, I, I thought that they would know or mm. Ponza or. Yeah. What can I say? I have bad handwriting. Right. It has nothing to do with anything, but okay. Crickets, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, anyway. But have you ever put together a half scene yourself? Or is it usually your mom that does it? Um, I, I, I would be lying if I said I put together myself. See, that's, that's I, the problem. Because the, well, it, it is one of those things where I've always gone to my mom's yeah. house for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As for, have I. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I didn't, I mean, I didn't properly pay attention, I suppose. Now I'll never get it wrong. I have memorized it. I know. I, next year I'm going to do my own half scene. Yeah. It's really silly that I don't. I do, yeah, yeah. I, you know, how I care about those things and of Thanksgiving. Course. I decorate my house, all yeah. that. I don't know why. I, I, I really think I've just deferred. I've been like a Persian kid about it. Like, oh, my mom's going to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the Sanjed thing, you know. yeah. In your defense, it kind of looks like Horma. But Keon has no defense. Duneye Samanu, Keon. Guys, I can barely speak Farsi. So <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect? Uh, everybody said you were very sweet in that video, oh. Keon. Yeah. Well, that's, very nice. That's nice to Nothing hear. like the way they expected you <laughs> no, to be. No, not, not reality, that's for sure. <laughs> Quite the opposite. <laughs> as you guys. By the way, you were doing your rhyme scheme again there, which of course leads you to be English. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Don't what be it so is. hasty. <laughs> the pizza is coming and it's tasty. I don't know. What's I mean, I was like, what? What character like, is this? What's wrong doing? with me psychologically? I have to go to a therapist. Like, why do I keep uh, doing I, I, this? Like, your version of ancient Iran is a bunch of Cockney guys at the <laughs> pub general, talking to each other. There Whenever were I mean, dates, mate, on the. On I don't the know pizza. what it is. <laughs> don't be so hasty. It's going to be tasty. <laughs> what? What what country? What what? What were you? And it's all passion. <laughs> Some Italian it's my sitting in voice. Brooklyn. I going. don't know why. Yeah, I just it's, uh, it's automatically it's, go it's to good. British. Uh, team, it's been fantastic. By the way, I should just mention. Um, I should have said this at the top of the show. We are four episodes away from mm. one hundred, and we have a very special guest. For actually, we got a couple of special guests coming up in the next few shows, but number one hundred. Uh, it's very exciting for us. We're it's looking huge. forward to that. We will, uh, uh, well, we're not going to announce it right now. Mm-hmm. Mm. But mm. stick around, it's folks. Huge. <laughs> Stay tuned. Captain Reza, Savvy Shy, <laughs> 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 Groovy Keon, thank you. And uh, thanks, to the, thanks to all you guys. It's full time for Rook for today. We depend on your support to stay alive. So if you go to our website, rookmedia.com, there's a little button that says support us there where you can become a Rook patron. 10 bucks a month. That does it and helps us stay alive. You can also link to all of our episodes, our guests, our hospitality segments, all of it there, rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. On to the artist, Thoughtful Nagin. Producer Susan, the fabulous Keon, Savvy Roham, Ahai Merdad, Master Muhammad, Chef Haas, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you have not done so already. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. And of course, Mizun Bashi. Mm-hmm.